icon at the bottom right hand corner of your screen and click on it, your map will go away. Got it? And some of you are smiling broadly because you're so annoyed with that little inset map. Yep, there you go. Jess is showing it right now. I see that smile, Paula. All right, uh, and, and one last reminder, we're gaining traction as a group. And with that comes a balance between hearing conversation, verbally sharing conversation and getting into things and using the technology that we have like Mural where you can write your thoughts. Everybody works differently. Everybody contributes in a different way. We need to work together to find that right sweet spot where everybody feels like they're participating and have shared their thoughts. So don't assume that you can't use your voice. If you don't want to write something down, that's fine. Come on, Mike, raise your hand, do whatever you need to do to share your thoughts that way. Everybody works differently. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to your chairperson, Jessica, so she can tee up our next body of work. If you're on the mural, it's section two in the green zone. Uh, and she's also, uh, we're going to use the PowerPoint slides that Jessica's pulled up. So you've got two options. Look at Jessica's feed from our Zoom meeting or look at the slides that are embedded into your mural in section two and you can just follow me if you're having a hard time finding it, your choice. And with that, Jessica, go ahead. Great, thank you, Stacy, and welcome back everyone from the break. Um, so I'm gonna go over uh, some of the scientific research that we're tasked to review. So I wanna preface this by acknowledging some biases I have about this process, given my experience doing psychedelic research in rigid medical settings controlled by the federal government, and also my long history in the psychedelic community and culture, and seeing some incompatibilities between these two. Um, so admittedly, I'm feeling pretty chewed up and spit out by the process of trying to advance the science, the science forward under very strict regulations that don't seem to align with the realities of how psychedelics work and are most effective. Um, so just keep that in mind when I present this, but I'm, I'm going to start by giving a basic overview um, so that people kind of understand what we're dealing with in terms of the process um, and how we can begin to evaluate the uh, literature and the data on this to help inform our recommendations from the scientific um, perspective. Um, and so the, the first slide is really just kind of, that's a picture taken from one of the publications um, kind of showing the difference in brain activity between placebo and psilocybin. Um, for anyone that read Michael Pollan's book, this was kind of in the like front cover um, on the inside of the book. It's just kind of a cool figure to show to highlight the stark differences of what's going on in the brain when people take psilocybin in this um, case. So next slide, please. Okay. Um, so again, I'm going to start by giving a basic overview of how new therapies are approved by the Food and Drug Administration, which um, moving forward I'll refer to as the FDA, um, just so I'm not using too many acronyms that people don't understand. Um, I'm also going to talk about some issues that we might face regarding the realities of how psychedelics work and some incompatibilities with the FDA and the Drug Enforcement Agency, known as the DEA, um, and their approval process. So I'll then show a very high level summary of what we know about the conditions that psychedelics may treat. And then I'll turn it over to Caroline, who will go over some of the scientific research methods and protocol that we're developing um, to explore and evaluate the existing evidence for MDMA, psilocybin, and LSD. Okay, so. So for this slide, really, um, what we know about kind of the drug approval process is kind of the gold standard for all of that is running through the clinical trials set forth by the FDA. Um, one important thing to note about clinical trials, and again, I just want to point out, like, I've been working in this field, I've been doing clinical trials, but I don't consider myself an expert on clinical trials. It's a very complicated process, but I do have some, some experience in this area. So... From my perspective, clinical trials are not therapy. They are science experiments under very tightly controlled conditions. Um, things such as placebo controls, which is like an inactive drug that you try to compare to the active drug to see if there's a difference. Um, usually there needs to be blinding to the drug group so that you can have an unbiased assessment of whether the drug performs better than, than a placebo or an inactive control. 
Um, and also being able to minimize the variability in the patient population that's being studied um, or evaluated to see if this might be an eff effective treatment uh, for that condition. But they usually kind of winnow things down and the inclusion criteria for these conditions don't always rec represent or reflect the realities of what some of these diagnoses have and some of the complications and other conditions that they might be struggling with. So the basic process of um, clinical trials is basically four different phases. Um, there's also kind of preclinical stuff, which would be like animal modeling and, and things like that. But this is really um, pertaining to what we look at in humans and the different phases for putting a new drug through this pipeline for FDA approval. So the first phase, phase one, is really um, focused on demonstrating safety and tolerability of the drug. Um, so usually they'll give people different doses and try to see kind of where are the boundaries in terms of how people respond to low or very high doses. Is there any toxicity? Um, and then sometimes there's some mechanisms that are studied um, typically in healthy populations just to figure out what is this drug doing in people. If that goes well, then people can move on to phase two. Um, and so this is really what we would consider feasibility testing. So it might be um, the first time that someone's looking at a specific patient population, whether it's depression or PTSD, to try and demonstrate whether it's feasible in that population, if there's any um, additional safety concerns that weren't worked out in the phase one um, trial with healthy people and getting some very preliminary efficacy to see, does this actually move the needle in changing some symptoms? Um, and there may or may not be a placebo control in phase two. Some are open label, meaning um, they're just testing the drug and how things change over time. And others will try to kind of randomly assign people to two different groups, one that would get a placebo and one that would get the active drug and then try to test if that works. If that all goes well, then a uh, drug can move on to phase three. And so phase three is really the kind of final clinical trial before FDA approval. And this really tries to demonstrate on a larger scale um, usually with multiple sites doing, doing these trials, whether there is efficacy compared to a placebo. And if, if this passes through the phase three clinical trial and shows that it's significantly better than a placebo control or treatment as usual, then the DEA must reschedule if the FDA approves it after that. And then there's phase four, which is basically once the drug is approved by the FDA and people are using it kind of in, in their practice or out in the wild, then they do effectiveness research to see, is there anything that would pop up in terms of side effects or different forms of implementation, or maybe it's using used off-label in different people? And is there anything else that, that we can understand about its effectiveness and its safety? And sometimes you'll see drugs being pulled off the market because things that weren't accounted for in the clinical trials are now coming to light as maybe not necessarily safe. Um, and so Keep that all in mind when thinking about this, but, but recognizing that this whole process is in fact um, science experiments <laughs> up through phase three. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the current state of the psychedelic clinical trials for the three different drugs that we're gonna be evaluating. So we're looking at MDMA, psilocybin and LSD. And it's um, interesting because each of these drugs are at very different stages in the drug approval process. So MDMA is the farthest along and it has completed two separate phase three clinical trials and it will likely be FDA approved and rescheduled before our final report is due. Um, so that's just something that we should consider um, and just kind of a good use case of like, this might already be approved. Is there anything else that we need to consider in trying to integrate it into our own kind of state system? And there's um, a phase four trial already registered for this to pair it with um, an evidence-based type of therapy for PTSD, uh, prolonged exposure therapy. Um, they'll need to wait for FDA approval before they actually start. And then there's um, another phase three that's registered. Um, for psilocybin, it's a little bit farther behind. Um, it's had some successful phase two trials, but it's just now getting started in phase three. So there's two separate phase three trials to look at uh, treatment resistant depression, one that's looking at a single dose um, of psilocybin and one that's looking at repeated doses of psilocybin. And those are just getting started. Um, so they're enrolling now. And so we don't really have the information yet from that trial, but we know that it's, it's being conducted. And lastly, LSD is much farther behind. Um, there have been a few successful phase two clinical trials, mostly in Switzerland, but I do wanna point out that in Switzerland, which is actually where LSD was invented, um, in 1988, they actually approved um, the legal use of psilocybin, or sorry, LSD for 
um, medicinal uses. So psychiatrists there can actually prescribe it um, as they see fit um, because they've been given permissions from their government to do so. So I think that's something to factor in um, in terms of kind of what, what are their clinical practice guidelines and how do we want to address that moving forward? Yes, Bennett. Thank you for that um, background. I have one question, which is about the uh, psilocybin phase three studies. Um, in reading about it, I I came across some um, some some literature, some journalism that discussed uh, particular um, methods for. I think these were some method of, of for delivery or or some part of the therapeutic process um, that's being used in those studies. That's um, I, th I think it's is it Compass Pathways that's the the um, the company that's studying it. Are, do you have any any perspective, or, or maybe this isn't the right time to discuss that? But are there are there any is there anything um, really narrow about the way that those um, phase three studies are are being done? Like um, that's you know sort of like a a specific trademarked process or something that's being used in those studies, or is it is it broader and it's it's like um, it's more akin to the MDMA studies where it, it, it's you know it, it's like a it, it you know it's it's at the discretion of the the clinical providers how they want to structure the the study. Does that make sense? Yeah, that that makes sense, and those are some good good issues to address, Bennett. Thank you. Um, so for the phase three trial for psilocybin, um, yes, it is Compass, and they're really just trying to push the drug through the trial. They provide psychological support, but they're not pairing it with like psychotherapy. And I'll get into that a little bit later regarding some guidelines that the FDA has about how to evaluate these drugs. Um, but it, it is different than what they're doing with MDMA, which is pairing it with a specific type of like cognitive therapy to enhance it. Um, so that's all been baked in as like MDMA assisted psychotherapy is technically what that would be called. Um, and then psilocybin is really just trying to see what is, is psilocybin doing in this condition with, with a mild amount of psychological support. I'm, I'm sorry. Now let me, let me just circle back around and ask one part of it a little bit differently. Is there any part of the psilocybin therapy being done by compass pathways that's like uniquely patented to compass and that wouldn't be more broadly, um, that, that wouldn't be more broadly, uh, usable or applicable by, by other companies. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm asking. Yeah, um, I want to be careful about how I address that because I am a sub investigator for um, this phase three trial because we do have a site here at the University of Minnesota. Um, so there's certain amount, certain aspects of it that I can't really talk about. Um, but I know that there was some efforts early on to try to patent aspects of the psychological support. I don't know if that patent got approved, um, but presumably like their compound, their formulation of psilocybin would be kind of probably under their patent. Like you can't patent mushrooms, but their kind of specific process for creating synthetic psilocybin would be kind of their thing, just like MDMA with, with MAPS. MAPS is going to have an exclusive right to be the pharmaceutical provider for MDMA once it's approved for about five years. So I don't know if Compass is going to follow that same path or not. Does that okay, answer? I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so I'm not going to go into this in detail. I just want folks to know that there is some draft guidance. It's in draft form, so it's not like final recommendations um, from the FDA about how pharmaceutical companies can push um, new psychedelic drugs through the clinical trials process for drug approval. Um, and so if you Google psychedelic, this titled Psychedelic Drugs Considerations for Clinical Investigations for the FDA, you'll basically find a PDF um, and we can share that with members that outline some things. But I wanted to highlight a few things that are a little complicated with the kind of realities of how psychedelic therapy works. Next slide, please. So the, the first thing that we're trying to grapple with, and, and this is gonna be important when we're evaluating the literature and efficacy and effectiveness and things like that, that Caroline will go over, um, is kind of the issue around placebo control. So what I was talking about, about having an inactive drug that you're comparing to 
the active drug and trying to detect differences. So because of the nature of psychedelics, they're very intense experiences. And so when you have an inactive drug and an active drug, one of which produces profoundly altered states of consciousness, it's very obvious very quickly which drug someone is getting, not only to the people watching and kind of holding space for them in the therapeutic setting, but also for the, the people taking the drug themselves. And so blinding in that context makes it really challenging. So the FDA is really trying to figure out how can we actually grapple with this so that we can maintain rigor um, in kind of the scientific evaluation of efficacy of these drugs. And another thing that's complicated is that um, given all the hype in the media about psychedelics, um, it's, it's hard enough to get blinding with psychedelics, but people are coming into these studies with a very high expectation that's, that these things will help them. And so when they end up in a placebo group, there's the risk of a nocebo effect, which is kind of the opposite. So a placebo effect would be they, they, they get better because they believe they got the drug, um, but they didn't. So we really try to figure out, can we test whether something's working above and beyond that kind of placebo effect and expectation? And if people are expecting that and they realize they're in the placebo group, it could actually make things worse. And so we would call that a nocebo effect where they're experiencing harm instead of benefit because of this inactive drug. So it's something that they're trying to consider of like, how can we actually appropriately find this so that we have a proper evaluation of efficacy. Next slide, please. And then this next bit, I think um, kind of gets to your point, Bennett, around um, a lot of the, the realities of what is most effective with psychedelic therapy is really pairing it with psychological support. A lot of clinicians are pairing it with evidence-based psychotherapy. So if somebody has depression, there are specific types of therapy that are useful for depression and adding the psychedelic to that potentially increases the effectiveness or the efficacy um, of that treatment. But it's, it's complicated in terms of scientific rigor to appropriately design a study that can account for these differences. So they're just kind of acknowledging that if a pharmaceutical company wants to go through the drug development process, it would be easier <laughs> to not include uh, psychotherapy as an adjunct. Um, and, and so I think that's what Compass Pathways is doing with their trial is really just saying, is this drug effect, uh, efficacious uh, for depression? Um, whereas uh, MDMA is actually testing, is it effective with psychotherapy? Um, compared to a placebo. So just some, some things to consider um, as we move forward and evaluate data from these clinical trials that are coming out. Next slide, please. And also, again, not gonna go into the details of this, just high level um, kind of pointing out that there has this recent systematic review um, has been pointing out that there are kind of reporting practices in psychedelic clinical trials in terms of people publishing the results of these trials in the literature that we're going to be reviewing. And there are kind of some criteria for how you share like methods and what was your blinding condition? How did you randomize people to placebo or not? And that unfortunately, in just purely evaluating the literature that's reported on this, there might be some stuff that's not being included. So people aren't like reporting every single thing that they do in their methods section for these papers. And so this might require us to basically go back and forth between the registered clinical trial that details everything about the experiment and the design of that, and then what's actually being reported in the literature. Because as Caroline will go over in the, in the research methods, um, there are these kind of tools that we can use that can help us evaluate the literature to understand whether um, some of these papers have um, demonstrated, you know, effectiveness or efficacy. Um, but if they're not providing a lot of that information, it's hard to really assess whether the study was designed correctly at face value in the literature. So, so we're really going to have to grapple with kind of evaluating everything that's out there, both in the papers and on the registries of clinical trials um, on the clinical trial website. Next slide, please. So, so this is something I feel like is, is kind of an issue we also need to deal with in thinking about what we're going to consider as evidence and how the FDA and the DEA have kind of handled this in the past. So I want to just kind of go over the example of the, the process for approving MDMA for PTSD. So MDMA was legal and being used in the 70s and 80s to treat trauma um, for couples therapy. And... At the same time, people were starting to kind of use it recreationally 
and the DEA got concerned and decided to put it on schedule one. Um, but there was a lot of clinicians at the time that were using it. They felt very strongly that this was an important drug to not schedule so that therapists could use it on their clients. And there was a lot of back and forth of submitting recommendations from all these clinicians that were using it. Based on all of that, one of the lawyers um, at the DEA actually suggested based on all of that, that it should be in schedule three, um, but they decided to override that recommendation and put it into schedule one. So fast forward 40 years, <laughs> um, MDMA is about to be approved for this exact same thing. Um, and unfortunately it's, you know, 40 years later, millions of dollars spent on the research and the clinical trials and probably countless lives lost in the process for people that could have otherwise accessed this therapy. So from my perspective, very little evidence is required to put a drug in schedule one, but there's a mountain of evidence that's required to reschedule it. So I think we just need to grapple with the realities of that. I'm hoping things have gotten better, but we do kind of need to think about what are the different hierarchies of evidence that Caroline will go over and what do we want to include in our recommendations for what we're going to do in Minnesota that might conflict with some of these FDA, DEA policies. Next slide, please. So there is um, a process for evaluating um, whether a drug might need to be rescheduled according to the eight factors of the Controlled Substances Act. I'm just highlighting this paper that was published five years ago um, by the folks at Johns Hopkins who've been doing this research with psilocybin for a while. They compiled all the evidence they had at the time, put it into this framework for the DEA's Controlled Substances Act according to the eight factors and came to the conclusion that it should be Schedule Four. And, you know, fast forward five years later, the data has just continued to kind of validate this. So, um, so yeah, but, but there hasn't been a rescheduling yet. So I think we also need to consider that. Next slide. And I don't want to get into this. It's just a very, very high overview that like we're, we're looking at LSD and psilocybin and MDMA. This is something that's on my lab website. If people want to geek out on this, you can go to my lab website and I have all of the actual references to the literature on this, but there are a lot of conditions that these drugs are showing potential benefit for from various levels of, of scientific research, um, whether it's animals, open label, placebo controlled trials. Um, and just kind of want to think about the reality that, you know, there are a lot of conditions that these things hit. A lot of these conditions have a lot of overlapping symptoms. Um, and so it's just, there is a lot of, of work to be done to really try to grapple with all of this evidence and what we want to decide as a task force to recommend to the legislature on, on, on how to kind of legalize all of this for therapeutic uses. And I think that's all I have for now. I want to turn it over to Caroline because she's going to walk over um, some of our research methods protocols and what we're going to think about and decide on as a task force for evaluating all of this literature. Caroline? Hi. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, you can, yeah, perfect. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, as a quick reminder of who I am, I'm Caroline. Uh, my background is in neuroscience. Uh, I got my PhD in the field in 2017, um, and I've been working as a neuroscience researcher since then. I'm also the MDH uh, staff research scientist who will be doing the scientific literature review, um, and I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to be able to chat with you all this morning. Um, you can go to the next slide, Jess. Thank you. So um, before I dive into what we've been working on for the scientific research methods, um, I, I just want to reiterate that what I'm talking about right now is just the strict scientific portion, um, which is itself just one piece of the overall pie that is the complete report and recommendation. So the cultural, socio-political, legislative, policy, um, any other related components will make up the rest of the pieces to form the whole report, um, but I won't be covering those here. And, you know, I particularly uh, want to make clear that the lived experiences of safe use and research, um, particularly those from indigenous peoples, is a valid form of evidence and data that you as a task force can and should be taking into consideration as well. Um, but for today, just right now, this section is just kind of strictly covering the scientific and medical portion. Um, so what I'll be presenting is the protocol that we're working on um, or the framework that we plan to follow when doing um, the scientific literature research. 
and we want to make sure that the task force feels comfortable with the way that we're proceeding. So while the protocol that I'll present is pretty standard scientific procedure, um, there are specifics that the task force can weigh in on. Um, and I, I also want to note that due to limited time today, I think we really only have roughly 40 minutes left to talk about this. Um, the actual discussion about the specifics may be a little limited, but please know that the mural is there um, and that there are sections corresponding to this presentation for member input. Um, so you can share your thoughts regarding the methodology um, and we'll get into that in specifics as we go. Uh, next slide, please. So first, I want to start with the, um, the high-level overview of the standard steps in this type of scientific research. Uh, much of this, uh, particularly the first handful of steps, uh, the task force can provide input on. Um, and so if it's helpful, you can think about today's presentation as the blueprint of what we're going to do. And so like building a house, having a comprehensive blueprint of what we're going to do before we do it um, is a, a necessary part of good, solid, and sound science. Um, so our goal today is to present this blueprint, get member input, um, and ultimately consolidate it to the final plan, which will be discussed and voted on in January's meeting. I also want to acknowledge that this will probably be a lot of information to take in. Um, and so if you're the type of person like me um, that likes to kind of sit and think about things before making a decision, please know that all of the activities on mural that we'll be doing will be live for the rest of the week. So you can think about these things. Um, but with all that in mind, these are the high level best practices steps in this type of research. Um, and I'll list them here and then I'll talk about each of them in depth as we go. Um, so as an overview, um, the first step in creating a scientific report is to consider what type of report or review that we'll be creating. Our next step is to define the boundaries of the research. Um, so this is kind of the big picture boundaries. And then we define the research questions. Um, and these are the specific questions that, we're, that we will be answering with our research. Next, we identify the databases from which we'll search. Um, and then we develop the search strategy in terms of the actual words or phrases that we will put into the search bar. Um, and then next, we develop comprehensive criteria on what studies from that search will be included or excluded and why. Um, and then the next bullet point here isn't necessarily a formal step, but it is something that a task force uh, will need to think about. And that is, what are the scientific levels of evidence that you would find compelling? Um, and again, remember, I'll, I'll go into each of these in depth to explain them. So after we've done all those steps, we run the actual search. Uh, we appraise the quality of those results using formal appraisal tools. And then all of the studies that make it through these filters will be analyzed. And then finally, we write the scientific portion of the report. Um, so that's the overview. And now we can talk about each step uh, in depth. Next slide, please. So the first step is deciding on the specific type of scientific report. So I'm going to briefly explain each of the three possibilities here. But this is also something that you know, maybe you think about um, in keep it in mind during the rest of this presentation before coming to a decision. So the highest level of review is the meta-analysis. And this is a scientific way to gather and analyze the results of many completed studies. And it's done using statistical methods that we would run. The next highest level of review is the systematic review. Um, this is another scientific way of gathering information in a prescribed manner to answer our specific research questions, but it does not use statistics. Um, finally, similar to a systematic review is the rapid review, um, which is really just a circumscribed version of the systematic review. Uh, if you're curious, Oregon used a rapid review for psilocybin in its study. Um, please also note that the steps of each of these types are largely the same, um, which is why they're being presented together. And again, you know, do keep these in mind as we discuss the rest of the methods and then we can circle back to this at the end. Um, but if you have thoughts on this, 
in Ural, uh, we have um, a location, it's panel A, the big green box. Um, and here, what we'll have you do when you're ready is um, put a star on the type of review that you think is the best option to proceed forward with. Um, so, and along with the three types that I just discussed, you'll see there's a fourth option. And if you would like to select that other category, please instead create a sticky with your thoughts um, and leave either your initials or uh, some other form of identifying information in case we on the staff side need clarification. Um, but again, it might be helpful to wait on this decision until we've um, talked about the rest of the method. Next slide, please. And so as we begin diving in, we need to keep in mind the scientific duties as outlined in the legislative draft, um, which I've provided here again. You'll notice that I've bolded the words efficacy and effective. Um, this is because in terms of science and medicine, these words each have precise and different definitions, which I'll cover on the next slide. Um, but I've also underlined a few things that I'll refer back to as we progress through the discussion. Um, next slide. So the first real decision that the task force um, needs to make is pretty foundational for the rest of the methods. Do you want to focus on researching efficacy, which this just refers to the performance of the treatment only under ideal and very controlled circumstances, um, like those found in a clinical trial, or do you want to expand to include effectiveness, um, which considers how the drug works in real world conditions? So real world conditions include things like, will the patient be able to access the treatment? Will they adhere to the treatment, um, et cetera? Any, anything that's you know, less rigid than the, the experiment. And so as with everything, you know, there's pros and cons of each route. So, if a task force decides to focus only on efficacy, the pros would be the bounds of research are very, very clear. Um, only the studies of drugs that have been rigorously tested in the phase two or three clinical trials could be included. And I have on the right here a reminder of what Dr. Nielsen just spoke about a minute ago, um, the phases of clinical testing was required for FDA approval and rescheduling. Um, but if the task force does decide only on efficacy. This then by extension means that only the health conditions that each drug has been tested to treat would be acceptable. Um, and this doesn't line up with the portion of the duties I just underlined, which directs that we study any, any mental health conditions or medical conditions. Um, and then you know, as a further reminder of what Jessica just mentioned, currently only MDMA has completed um, the phase three trials um, you know, psilocybin has some currently registered phase three trials, none of which are complete, and LSD has really only been uh, tested in phase two. Were the task force to choose to open the definition a little and choose effectiveness of the drugs, um, and certainly gives more wiggle room in how we approach the research, but of course adds its own hurdles, um, particularly regarding where you as the task force would want to draw the boundaries of what types of evidence you find convincing. Um, so that is, you know, this would require us to create the boundaries rather than having a built in like with efficacy. Um, also, unlike efficacy studies, which are very circumscribed, um, effectiveness would cover a larger body of work. I do want to note, strictly speaking, phase four trials um, evaluate the effectiveness in a rigorous way. But of course, since none of these drugs have reached this phase, we obviously can't study something that doesn't exist. Um, so here, here's where we can pause like very briefly if anyone has any immediate thoughts um, on whether we focus on literature evaluating just efficacy or if we can include effectiveness. Um, but again, there is also space in the mural in panel A uh, where you could place a star on the option um, you prefer. Or if you have some other thought, um, please use a sticky with identifying information um, to clarify. And I don't know if I can see if any hands are up. Yeah, we got okay. Ren and Ari. Okay. Uh, Ari's on my screen first. 
You're muted. Just kidding. Okay, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, so um, one clarifying question I have is about what we mean by real world conditions and the bounds of scientific research because so like there's the phase four real world conditions like as part of a scientific trial, but there's also like real world conditions from like community groups and like people who have recorded their experiences like in a report or something like that, like a community groups report. But that real world experience would be somewhere else in our recommendations, right? Like not part of this scientifically rigorous portion of the report. You know what I mean? I do. And I think, I mean, you are, you are technically correct. Yes. Um, but this is also something that um, the task force can decide if they, if they want to include this here or if they want to include this in its own separate section. Uh, we didn't want to make that decision for you. So this probably is a further area of discussion. Yeah. And, and just to follow up on what Caroline said, um, and from my perspective, the effectiveness, given that nothing's been FDA approved, really is kind of historical uses and all of its flavors. And, and how do we want to grapple with evaluating all of that to understand how effective is it in a variety of settings and in conditions and um, drug sources? Totally. So we do want to include that, his, like the historical uses somewhere, right? Uh, I yes, think absolutely. Okay. And, yep. Yeah, I, just, actually, I was just going to add that um, I would support the efficacy and effectiveness. Uh, we know how we have some literature or at least anecdotal information on how patients or people use these drugs on the underground we know that people have access to this in the underground um but what i like about the effectiveness is that um it expands the number of diagnoses that we can use that we can potentially use in our final report so i would support that and this is stacy yep I just wanted to make sure I've summoned everybody to the area that Caroline's been talking about, the what are bound the, the boundaries of scientific research. Do we want to include the efficacy, efficacy and effectiveness, other combination? This is a space for you to put your sticky notes and additional comments if you don't want to verbalize them. And also, I think this is working now. Yes, you can just drag a star over and pop a star over by your choice if you don't want to do a whole sticky note. And Bennett, you've got a question. I do. My question is probably best directed at uh, Representative Smith or, or anyone else who worked on the drafting of the bill. Um, I'm looking at the, the language of the bill and, and it, it sort of says both. It says we, that we should be looking at the efficacy, um, but sort of the, looking at the efficacy to help us understand the effectiveness. Um, that, so my question for Rep, Rep Smith or, or anyone else who worked on the bill is, was this a question that you were considering when drafting the language? Meaning, is, is it something that we should we should be hyper alert about what the, the bill's restrictions are here or boundaries are here? Um, I don't think by the, the letter of the bill there's restrictions here. I would just add that I think there's two layers to this. I think um, uh, the public is gonna really need to understand the efficacy um, because I think there's just, uh, as Dr. Nielsen said earlier, there's a lot of talk about this and, and need, they need to know uh, what to believe and if they, they want to use these drugs or not. Mm -hmm. I think for the our task force itself, I think efficacy is the more important option um, because we have lots of very already educated folks here on the efficacy or not efficacy of certain ways these drugs have been used historically. And I think, especially since we are focused on the state of Minnesota, particularly, I think it's it's more helpful for us to spend more time on effectiveness. Um, so that in drawing up the bill, that was sort of my thought on that sort of two tiered approach, if that makes sense. This is Stacy. In terms of group process, I see many of you are putting stars in the areas that you are thinking make the most sense based on the question that Caroline posed. 
You can keep working on that. If you've got any questions, send me a private chat and I'll help you with tech issues. Uh, but that's the space that you're working in right now should you choose to make your decisions now as opposed to later on this week when you've got some more quiet thinking time. And back over to you, Caroline, if you wanna keep the group moving. Excellent. Um, all right, uh, next slide, please, Jess. So the next step in the process is to refine the scientific questions that we're asking. Uh, right now, we've crafted two questions based on those two legislative duties for each drug. So to clarify at present, each of the three drugs has two questions asked about it. I mean, again, so these questions have been crafted to be a balance of specific to the legislation, but suitably broad to cover um, everything it asks. So the first duty, keeping in mind, again, the underlined portion of the duties from earlier, referring to any mental health and medical conditions, suggests that we are to identify all and any of the conditions that each of these drugs may treat. And so turning that into a question, we have what are the health conditions that MDMA, psilocybin, or LSD show in show efficacy or effectiveness, whichever we land on, um, in treating. And so a broad question like this, I know it seems very broad, but it, it helps to take away any bias um, that we may have or any kind of ignorance we might have by unintentionally excluding a condition just because we couldn't think of it right now. Um, and so to be clear, for this first question, it would be asked three times, uh, replacing the words each drug with either MDMA, psilocybin, or LSD. The next duty in the legislation suggests that we compare the psychedelic treatments against current gold standard treatments for all of those identified conditions. Um, and turning that into a question for each drug leaves us with what is the efficacy or effectiveness of each drug, MDMA, psilocybin, or LSD, in treating um, the conditions noted in duty one as compared to their current gold standard treatment. Something to keep in mind here with a very big question like this is uh, to truly do this portion in line with scientific standards, um, as well as the second set of underlines in the duties of the slide, um, we may need to run a meta-analysis that involves statistics on this portion. Um, so, you know, we can pause here again for any immediate discussion or thoughts on these questions, but I'd also like to, again, direct you to Mural, and you can see that there are three panel Bs, and that's one for each drug, containing each of the two questions. So if you are okay with these proposed questions, again, please place a star on each of them. If you have any other questions, please create a sticky again with your initials. Um, or, you know, in this case, if you're largely okay with the two questions, but you'd like to amend language in them, please feel free to create a sticky underneath each question with your thoughts. And again, please note that it says efficacy slash effectiveness, but this will change depending on task force input. Um, and I see some hands. I can't see the whole screen, so I might rely on you, Stacy, to um, call on yep. individuals. Paula's got her, Paula, I see Paula, your hands up, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so just to help me understand, I, I understand the, you know, the rigor of this conversation and, you know, it seems incredibly in depth regarding kind of, you know, medical, therapeutic, um, evidence-based, you know, studying the research. You know, the FDA and the and, and the DEA are kind of deciding which medicate, which med which drugs, which you know, which psychedelics are going to be approved for what treatments. So that's kind of they're sorting out the medical stuff. I'm not quite sure why we're talking about it. To be perfectly honest, I thought we were, I thought we were charged with whether or not we we're going to legalize these 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 um, these uh, psychoactive agents for um, for for use. And so I think it seems like the FDA and the DEA are working on the medical stuff. So maybe I'm missing something. I think I can touch to that a little bit unless you have something, Caroline. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of boils down to, and this might be more a question of like the legal research. And I think this is more um, Bennett's area of expertise of like, we have our own process for trying to approve this that might be in direct conflict with what 
the federal government wants. So this is kind of just our understanding using the pipeline that has already been set out for how do we evaluate whether something's therapeutic um, or harmful according to our own state's Controlled Substances Act. Um, and so I think following that does help us evaluate whether something works or not through, through this process. Um, but ultimately we're gonna have to grapple with, with kind of the, those discrepancies. So what goes into our own Controlled Substances Act and how do things get scheduled or rescheduled onto that? And that's kind of what we have to grapple with. Um, and from my understanding, I think we have to kind of deal with like the 10th amendment for just having state autonomy. Um, but I think that's more of a legal question that Bennett might be able to address. But that, that's kind of my, my understanding of this, that we do need to have a comprehensive evaluation of the medical literature and the science to inform the legislature on kind of what might be different than what the federal government wants. So this is Stacy. Let's just pause and see if there are any other questions like this that we want to raise right now, because it's important that everybody's clear on the directives. So let's just pause, let's see if there are any more clarifying questions. Okay, seeing and hearing none, I'm going to, oh, go ahead, Helen. Well, as I look at uh, task number one and uh, efficacy and effectiveness, I'm wondering about the tension between those two ideas and, um, and if efficacy is already kind of the gold standard, if you will, then um, it, it kind of calls into question uh, the, task force ability to, to really identify methodologies or treatments as effective does I mean that that kind of they kind of seem juxtaposed to me and maybe I'm not understanding that unless the task force has then a section that talks about limitations and maybe talks in terms of preliminary effectiveness or something like that because if it's not the gold standard are we in a position to really say it's effective or not I think Thanks, that's Helen. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I feel like if from my understanding of the bill and what we're charged with is we get to decide that and we have to create a set of recommendations to convince the legislature whether they want to create a bill around this based on those recommendations and that it might conflict with kind of these gold standards of what we consider for efficacy that the federal government needs and how can we how can we push this forward according to what we want and what we think is best for our state and our people? Um, Renji, it sounds like, looks like you have a comment and then Dana. Yeah, I was just going to add on to what Helen was saying is I think that is important. I mean, I support this efficacy and effectiveness, but um, we do need to, our charges to also explain how we came to these decisions. So being able to decide, uh, being able to communicate um, clearly and coherently the, the, the reasoning behind why we're choosing efficacy versus effectiveness, um, and also um, humbly communicating that there are limitations to that as well, so that this feels like it's a transparent process, which it, which it is. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Renji. Dana? And Ranji, I really appreciate what you just said there, because I think, you know, going back to the task force of, of advising the legislature on the legal, medical and policy issues, particularly with the medical, as we've talked about and grappled with, there is a range. And so when we think about our audience of not just the legislatures, but then the legislatures thinking about how this impacts providers in the broadest sense. And also thinking about as consumers, you know, when you're thinking about taking a medicine or uh, doing something, what level of evidence do you want to have when you're considering about being a consumer? So I think there's different levels of evidence, different audiences also, the legislatures, potential providers, and potential consumers. So um, I think we're having a robust discussion about the whole uh, sort of boardwalk that we have to cover. And it's a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yep. 
This is Stacy. Are there any other members that want to comment on this? I do, and I can't find my hand raising button, so I'm just going to go off. That's okay. <laughs> That's um, just fine. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Who was speaking, though? I, oh, I this didn't is Courtney. Catch on my screen. Thanks, Courtney. Go ahead. Um, I don't know what evidence is out there, but I'm just curious about considering some of the research that may be out there about the consequences of drug policy and the negative impact and looking at some of that to include it in, you know, the the research questions that we're thinking about. I'm seeing some heads nodding with that. So That's it. It let me, let me jump in really, really quick with that. Um, the, next, the next slide will start talking about where we can include negative consequences um, and, and negative results as well. So this is Stacy. Before we go to the next slide and I turn it back over to Carolyn, I would like you all, all members to uh, turn your attention over to the mural. I'm gonna summon all of you because I want you to know where you can put your input on this topical area that we've been thinking about. Um, so right now you see the area of the screen here, down here where my cursor's going around are the slides that um, Caroline's talking you through. We talked a little bit about your input from area A down here. When she's talking about these three B screens, they're right here, B, B, and B. So if you want to weigh in on MDMA and drag a star over because you think question two is the way to go for the research, or you've got a different idea, it should be one, you can drag a star over. Or if there's some other question that you think is more appropriate for MDMA, for example, you can put a sticky note down here and put your questions down here. So MDMA up here is silo, that's that one. I'm gonna get that word down and LSD down here. So that's where we're working right now. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Caroline. She'll, with uh, Jess's help, we'll pull the slide deck back up on the main screen, okay? Thank you, Stacy. I wanna mm -hmm. know, please vote on both questions. Um, not just one or the other, ah, okay. Um, but okay. So as we as we move on, I also want to be cognizant of time. We only have we have less than fifteen minutes left in my portion, um, and a lot of stuff left to cover. So while we're having wonderful discussions, I might kind of talk a little quicker to make sure we stay on track with the meeting. So the next step is to identify the databases that we'd like to use. So given our discussion at last month's meeting we made sure to include both the academic literature, which includes literature from your traditional academic or commercial publishing sources, um, as well as gray literature, which is kind of largely everything else, including clinical trial registries, company and industry ride um, repositories, regulatory agency archives, abstracts of papers and poster presentations, um, institutional personal websites. Um, those are just a few quick examples. But so breaking these down into two, we've identified PubMed as the most comprehensive academic source. This source is maintained by the National Institutes of Health um, and the United States National Library of Medicine. Um, and it includes science and medicine literature, but also literature from psychology and related disciplines. Um, so while the latter have their own databases, consolidating into the most efficient source is probably the best use of our time as a task force. Uh, we've also noted the need for indigenous research sources. Uh, while I personally am familiar with some of the sources provided from the University of Minnesota, any um, recommendations on specific databases are welcomed. Um, however, we're aware that many ways of knowing are protected um, and we wanna be cognizant of that and of the work that's being done while not being extractive. Um, so next we have gray literature. Um, so this is where we've identified a couple potential sources. We've got um, the National Clinical Trial Registry, clinicaltrials.gov. Um, this source includes all registered clinical trials, those that haven't started, those in process, and those that have finished. Uh, we've also identified the Cochrane Library, 
This is an online library of systematic reviews um, and randomized control trials. And we've also identified that these are pronounced BioArchive and MedArchive. Um, these are preprint servers, meaning that they're not peer reviewed yet, but many are in the process of that review. So these articles focus on biology and medicine, including the newest research um, and negative results. So this is where we're going to get things that maybe um, aren't always traditionally published in the academic sources, noting kind of the more negative outcomes of the trials. And so, you know, we can pause here for very, very immediate um, discussion on this database if you, issue if you want, um, but this also is in mural as well. You'll find this in panel C. Um, and so you can place a star on any of the databases that you are all right with including. Um, and please use stickies to provide any other recommendations. Um, and again, I can't see if there are hands, um, but if not, we can go ahead and move to the next slide. And Caroline, this is Stacy. I've reworked the agenda and I'm seeding you 10 minutes of my time. So you've got oh, until 1145, you. okay? Wonderful. And members, you. if you're like panicking about where am I supposed to put my sticky notes and my input, we'll go back over all of it after Carolyn's done with the slideshow. So no one will be left behind, okay? Thank you. Go ahead, Carolyn. Um, mm -hmm. So the next step after we've identified databases is to create um, the very specific search terms, typically using Boolean logic search queries. Um, and so this is a very specific search language. Uh, an example of this is here, but the specific search terms will be crafted and we will present them again before running the formal sort or search. So you as a task force don't necessarily need to worry about this part, um, but I will explain it. Um, so we'll devise a list of specific search terms for each question, for each drug, for each database. So this string of characters here um, at the bottom is an example only for MDMA for one question and only in PubMed. So again, these search terms will be different based on each how each database works. So to kind of make this more concrete, if we were to use just the databases that presented on the last slide, that would mean that there's at least 18 unique search strategies. Um, so again, this is not something that you need to worry about right now, but I, I do want to present that for transparency's sake. Um, next slide, please. So the next thing that we need task force input on um, is something that Dana was touching on a bit ago is what level or levels of scientific evidence that we could find would you feel comfortable with when making recommendations? And again, please remember that this presentation is just about the science. Um, so I wanna make clear, we don't expect this diagram to be the only source that you would use on what's valid evidence or not. Um, this is just strictly for when we do the scientific review. Um, so this is a basic graphic of levels of evidence going from least rigorous on the bottom to most rigorous at the top, each one building upon the last. Um, so at the bottom, we have animal studies and other lab studies. Next, we have case reports, which means, you know, someone showed up at the doctor's office with some condition and they wrote about it after the fact. They did not cause this. Um, next, we have the case control studies, which are also observational studies um, in that the researchers look at the case report individuals and compare them with control individuals. And so those are those individuals not experiencing the condition. And again, this is just observational. The next level of evidence is cohort studies um, or longitudinal studies in that individuals are tracked over a long amount of time to see what happens to them. Again, this can be just watching and not doing. Um, the next level of evidence is a randomized control trial. Um, these are used to attempt to control factors that are not under the direct experimental control. And so for us, direct experimental control would mean the drug in question. And so clinical trials can be an example of this. Um, next, we come to meta-analysis and systematic review level. Uh, I explained these at the beginning. 
they're near the top because they are the compilation and synthesis of several full studies beneath them. And then finally, at the very top, we have clinical practice guidelines, which are systematically developed guidelines based on all the supporting studies below um, that help the physician or the practitioner make decisions for the patient. These are included here because there are other countries, like Jessica was mentioning, um, Switzerland, where these medicines are already legal, um, and therefore there already are clinical guidelines regarding their use. I mean, of course, keep in mind, though, that they will have gone through different legal avenues than how our government might handle them. Um, so with this, your task is to decide what levels of scientific evidence we should be pulling our data from. And so in mural, area D has the same image. Um, so please feel free to put stars on the levels that you level or levels that you find acceptable. Um, we can discuss it super briefly um, if anyone has any thoughts, or I can move to the next slide. I see, I, I do see one hand. Paula. Um, I'm just gonna circle back just for my own clarity. So Jessica mentioned that the charge, potential charge of the task force is that we are gonna de determine how the Minnesota Controlled Substances Act differs from the federal. Our bill may conflict with the federal recommendations. So just to help me be clear, um, I know that we're working on medical, legal, and policy. So our intention is to look at the medical recommendations coming out of the FDA and the DEA and how we may have different recommendations based on the literature review or whatever scientific approach evaluation system we choose to make different recommendations for clinical practice, therefore clinical practice meaning healthcare, people that are building insurance or choosing to use these um, psychoactive agents for clinical purposes. And we're also looking at changes to the Minnesota Controlled Substances Act where we may be pursuing some exemption under the Federal Controlled Substances Act for the possible legalization of substances. So is that accurate that we're looking at our own Controlled Substances Act related to clinical and legal um, in terms of legalization? And so, I mean, is that really what we're intending to do is to shape how it will happen clinically in Minnesota, as well as how whether it happens from a non-clinical perspective like what's happening in Oregon and Colorado? Bennett, can you weigh in on this or somebody? Yeah, I mean, that's a question. I, I can I can weigh in only to say that that's also a question um, that I have. And I think it's one for the broader group as opposed to one. I, as as the the as the lawyer on the board, I think is that there might be more than one, but I th I see my my job, my role in is is to give effect to what the rest of the board wants to do. Um on on that point. Yeah. I, I mean whether right, that's that's a that's a question for the whole for the whole uh group, I think. Ari, go ahead. Oh but maybe on uh, without mute I'm on. Sorry. That's all right. Should I go to yes? Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. Um, thanks, Paula. Yeah. So I think part, yeah, like, yes, and like, I think we're definitely considering changes to the Controlled Substances Act, because I think this, that's where a lot of this lives in our in our code. But there's other places where our code might be impacted as well. Like there's different parts of the state code that look at like, um, like where the pharmacy board statutes live, like that's somewhere else. And then like, how healthcare facilities and providers are regulated, that that's somewhere else in the code. And then if we wanted to do something else around reparations, that that would live somewhere else. So I think it's not just the Controlled Substances Act. It could be like multiple places in the code that we might be proposing changes. And again, this is Stacy. I summoned you all over to that pyramid so that you can put your marks down on where you think uh, uh, the task force should land. Um, and I guess I just want to make sure that Caroline has taken a quick peek over there to make sure you're okay seeing some folks put their stars over by primary studies or observational studies. Uh, I don't know if any clarification needs to happen over on the left side outside of the pyramid. So I'll just have you take a quick look in there, make sure that you're good, 
Carolyn and and Jessica for that matter. Sure. Yeah, I so you can see that there's kind of brackets that are, you know, primary studies has the um, yellow, green and blue. So as I take this from individuals, the star would mean they were comfortable with anything from the yellow, green or blue rather than putting it just on one. I mean, the same with observational saying they would be comfortable with something from the yellow or green um, okay. levels, if that, if I'm understanding that correctly. No, okay. Anybody else have any clarifying questions on the pyramid and, and weighing in? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Caroline, back to you then, if you want to pick up the slide deck uh, from wherever you left off. Yeah, absolutely. So we can move to the next slide, Jess. Okay, thank you. So this, this one might, might be a bit of a doozy. I'll try to get through it quickly. Um, so the next step in creating the scientific report of this nature is to decide before we search, what criteria will be used to either say, yes, this paper that we found can be part of the literature we research, or no, we should not include this study, here's why. Um, I also want to preface that you know the more restrictions that we place up front, the more biased our report risks being. Just keep that in mind. Um, the following are some of the most commonly used scientific inclusion or exclusion criteria that we've landed on moving forward with so far. I mean, I'll go through each of them individually, but before I start, do know that each of these considerations is in mural in panel E, um, and we will go through it at the end of the slide. Um, so to start, the first criterion is the range of dates from which we can choose the studies. Intuitively, it makes sense to include all possible ranges, but something to note is that IRB approval wasn't part of the process until the 1970s. IRB stands for Institutional Review Board, which is a committee that reviews and monitors research involving humans to ensure protections of their rights and their welfare as research participants. Um, so research into psychedelics occurred before the 1970s. So this, you know, for some members on the task force may raise ethical considerations around consent and methodology. Um, but on the other hand, there have been some recent studies that have shown evidence replicating those pre-IRB findings, suggesting that the results are still sound. Um, Oregon, when passing their legislation, used all date ranges. Um, this is just something for you to keep in mind. Um, so our next consideration is the exposure of interest which you can think of as the condition of interest or what the participants in the study needed to have experienced to have been included. Um, so given that the studies we're looking at are investigating these particular psychedelic medicines in the treatment of health conditions, kind of in that vein, the most inclusive criteria would be having taken the drug of interest in the context of any health condition. Um, so basically, this question is asking, what are the conditions around having taken this drug that the task force is comfortable with? Um, our next consideration is geographic location, and that is the physical location in which the study took place um, or was published. Uh, so this would be, for example, you know, the United States or Canada, you know, et cetera, something broad. And so the most comprehensive criterion for that is no restriction. Um, Another related criterion is the language in which the study is published. Um, to be thorough, there would be no restriction, um, but the reality of figuring out a way to reliably translate a scientific study might be worth consideration. Um, our next criterion is the population of interest. Um, so this wasn't explicit in the legislation, but it seems like it might be good practice to say that we're investigating these drugs efficacy or effectiveness in an adult population. Um, and then apart from that, you know, the, the most comprehensive criterion would be no restriction apart from being an adult. Um, so our next criterion asks us if we only want to include studies that have been peer reviewed. This question is actually kind of pre-answered in the decision on efficacy versus effectiveness. Um, so if we, do land on only efficacy in the formal definition, then 
this would only include peer-reviewed studies and would exclude gray literature. If the task force prefers to broaden the scope to include effectiveness, then it's kind of already been pre-decided that no, we do not limit ourselves to peer-reviewed only. Um, if, if we were to end up doing some sort of hybrid approach, you know, maybe question one, we did a systematic review, but question two, uh, we did a meta-analysis, we could specify then where peer review was the inclusion or exclusion criteria. Um, and so even though this decision is kind of made further back in the steps, it is, it is good practice to formally recognize it. So our next criterion is the type of reported outcome, primary or secondary. In scientific studies, there are hypotheses, which are the proposed explanations that are being tested in the study. So that is the researchers are explicitly testing if their idea is supported or not by the data they collect. And the data they collect that directly answers their question is the primary outcome. However, there are also secondary outcomes, which while still planned are typically not those that are the primary, the main goal of the study. And you know, while they support the primary outcome and provide additional evidence, they're not kind of the main goal. And these kinds of outcomes are typically reported in clinical trials. And so as such, the task force um, has the opportunity to decide if only the primary outcomes are acceptable or if the supporting secondary outcomes um, will be included as well. Uh, a note is that Oregon included secondary outcomes, but it's also worth noting um, that if the primary outcome doesn't support the hypothesis, it's not necessarily good science to include the secondary outcomes if they do. Lots to think about, um, but we have some time on that. So our next consideration is um, referring to the setting in which the psychedelic drug of interest for us is used in the study that's reporting it. So some examples could be within a controlled clinical trial, in a psychoanalytical therapy session, you know, at healing centers, or even even at home counts as a setting. Um, and so the task force can provide input on deciding if there are settings that should be excluded. Our next criterion is the study design. Um, and so there are several types of study design, you know, and that is the, the way these studies are developed. And so broad categories can be found in that pyramid image um, that we've just discussed and it's on mural. Um, but for example, do we only want to include randomized control trials? Would we allow survey type studies? Are studies that are open label in that, you know, both the patient and the providers know the treatment condition, are those all right? Um, or do we want to, you know, do we prefer the strict single or double label blind condition? Um, keeping in mind what Jessica noted about the difficulty in really blinding that in terms of psychedelic research. Um, and the availability of research that's out there. The most comprehensive criterion in this would be no restriction. Um, the, the type of publication as our next criterion is, is similar, it's related, um, and it can also be found sort of on that pyramid image, and it refers to the outputs of the studies themselves. Um, so you know, types of publications might include only the primary studies um, where they're doing the research, or that could expand to include, you know, maybe we look at other systematic reviews or other meta-analyses. Um, and then this also would be where the boundaries on gray literature would come in um, for you to think about. But the most comprehensive criterion would be no restriction on this type as well. Again, keeping in mind the levels of evidence that you thought about earlier. Um, so again, all of this information um, and a way for you to express your thoughts about them is in mural in panel E. Uh, we also have a panel above panel E with space for any other criteria that you know we may have inadvertently not included today. Um, and so you know we have just a just a very brief amount of time left and still maybe four or five slides to get through so we can have a very quick discussion on this and then I will rapid fire through the next handful of slides. Um, if there's any hands. Yeah, Renji. Uh, great summary. I have a question about the types of publications. Um, 
when we think about exclusion of certain types, can we exclude, for example, case reports of therapy uh, success or failures versus uh, excluding, including uh, case reports of, say, safety and toxicity? Can we pick and choose, like, exclude uh, toxic or include toxicity studies or case reports, but exclude case studies of or case reports of of therapeutic uh, uh, reports? I don't see why not. I think the most important thing is that for us moving forward, we lay these out clearly and we have justification for them. Um, Because in in the final report, we will need to justify why we chose what we chose. And as long as we have an answer for that, um, you know, up front before we start, I, I personally don't see any problem with that. Thank you. All right, any other considerations? And okay. Caroline, Caroline, this is Stacy. I've, I've already um, backed up the break once. Um, if it's okay with you and Jessica, if it's okay with you, maybe do we do a quick break now uh, to honor that about every hour uh, request and, and then come back and you can wrap up then, Caroline. Is that okay? Absolutely. That works for me. Thumbs up. All right. So 10 minute break for everybody that will put us back at 1156. I'll get that sticky note put on the the screen in a little while and know everyone I'm here. If you are having tech issues, I'm not going anywhere. I'll answer your questions during break or send me a private message or direct message and we'll figure things out together. Okay. See you in 10 minutes, everyone. And it is 11.56. Hopefully everybody's back and uh, at their desks, ready for the final round of work for the task force. And we are in the midst of a conversation about the background information and methodology. Uh, we've had presentations by Jessica. Caroline is uh, just gonna finish up her slide deck and we've had a slew of um, questions that we pose to members to give some of their thoughts, either verbally or on the screen. Just a reminder, I'll walk you through all of those areas for input on the mural as soon as Caroline's finished her work. She said she's going to power through these last slides uh, very quickly, and I'm going to hold you to that. Caroline, so we can get into our last segment uh, here today. So Caroline, back over to you. And uh, we're on the develop inclusion exclusion criteria slide. Go ahead, Caroline. We can actually move forward one um, onto slide 32, Jeff. Can I, am I the only one that can't see it? It's up. Oh, okay. Weird. Then I can't see it. So um, um, I can cameras being weird. Um, so, okay. So our next step after we have done um, or created the inclusion and exclusion criteria is to, just, is to do the search. Um, so we will input each of the search terms into the database the search bars. Uh, we log each search and the results that it outputs in a spreadsheet. Um, and this will be made available to the public. After that search is run, then the criteria we just discussed will be applied um, to the resulting list of studies. Uh, Next slide, please. And so once the criteria have been applied, we begin analyzing the ones that are left. And we do this through critical appraisal tools, which are checklists that have been developed in a standardized way to assess the quality of the study after it's met kind of all of our initial expectations or or, um, filters. Um, So these tools also provide further justification on why studies were or were not included in our final report. Um, Currently, the JBI has a wonderful list of these tools for various, almost all types of studies, and there are tools that we can develop for the gray literature as well. Uh, Next slide. After all the searching and filtering and appraising, um, then we read and we analyze the study 
all relevant data is extracted, it is logged again in a spreadsheet and analyzed. And next slide. So then after that, everything is summarized into a narrative form. Um, this includes the methods that we've worked on, um, the search strategies we employ, the data, any statistics where we to do a meta-analysis and a, a narrative response of the science. And then the science portion is finished. Um, so next slide, please. So this is just um, a quick recap on everything that the task force we talked about today that you may want to weigh in on, um, preferably by the end of the week. Um, and so now that you have all this information, you know, maybe you can circle back to our very first step, which is the review type. Um, you know, given that we have all this information now, maybe you can make a more informed decision than earlier. Um, and again, this is in mural and panel A. Um, next slide. So this is um, you know, some kind of final thoughts. This is a very tentative timeline that is based on that workflow presented much earlier in the meeting uh, for everyone to keep in mind kind of how the research will work. Um, and again, this is, this is just the scientific portion, nothing else. Um, and it, again, is very tentative and probably will change. Next slide. And then finally, um, I wanna note that while we have individuals with extraordinary experience experiences on a wide range of subjects um, related to psychedelic medicine, we have the opportunity to reach out to other qualified individuals if you would like. Um, at present, here are the names of two physicians who might be able to provide input on methods should the task force need their guidance. Um, please let us know if you think the consultation is something you want, um, or feel free to provide outside sources as well. Um, so with that, I am finished. Thank you for listening. That was a lot of information. Um, remember that the mural activities will be up for the rest of the week. After that, we will compile everyone's thoughts, consolidate them, and then we can discuss any sticking points on the methodology next month uh, with the goal to, to finalize and get started. Um, so I am finished. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So um, I'm going to summon everybody over to my mural and... Jess, if you could share that on the screen, that would be great. I just want to point out one more time what your tasks are, members, by the end of this week. So you know you can go into the mural whenever you want until Friday uh, and give your thoughts. So I know this is very small for you. I'll zoom in in a minute. But you know that both slide decks that we used are right here in two and in three in the green box area. And your work is to go into A, both the top and the bottom, to put your stars in or stickies if your stars aren't working on the type of scientific report we want to create. If you've got more comments about types or combinations, you can put it over here. So that's task number one in block A. Task number two, which most of you I think have finished is what are the boundaries of the scientific research we want to include? You can weigh in there using your stars, using your sticky notes, and then go down to the three B boxes, one, two, three, and fill in information using your stars or using your sticky notes here on these three categories. So just follow the directions in the boxes. Once you're done with B, you can go over to C. And thanks for the person that said, you got to fix this. It's all fixed now. So if you drag a sticky star, it should come up right on top of the screen. And weigh in on academic base databases, includes literature from traditional academic or commercial publishing sources, often peer reviewed liking this, liking that, or giving us some other ideas. Same thing over on gray literature. We'd like to get your thoughts in there. Now, of course, we'll compile all this and share back the summary at, at the next meeting. Then down to the pyramid, which I think most all of you have weighed in on. And your final task is in this big box E. That was the last thing that Caroline was talking about with all of those different 
topics, the data ranges with some options here to star or make some comments on all the way through there. So there's nine categories here that you need to weigh in on. And if that's not enough for you, you've run out of space, just follow this area up here and say, okay, you forgot whatever it is and pop something up in here. So you've got a little bit of extra workspace. So that's your task related to this first area of work on scientific methodology. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna check in with you to see if I've lost you on all things logistic here. So speak up if I've lost you. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Or wasn't that Dave? I thought I saw somebody pop up. Yep, that, that would be me. Go ahead, Dave. Did I lose hey, you? I, uh, yeah, I just want to clarify uh, mm -hmm. the one about the language of the publication. Um, so if non-English is chosen, what would be a way to communicate it to I assume that I am I am only well versed in English. I I don't have no other English. So how how that would be applicable to members? Yep. And Caroline or Jessica, do you want to answer that? Because you don't want me answering it. You know. I mean, I can speak to that. There are a fair number of studies on that PubMed uh, database that Caroline was showing that are in French or Spanish or, or Japanese or some other language. There are kind of like Google Translate that could be used. It's just sort of relying that that's accurately translating the entire article without having somebody who is proficient in that language to help us um, translate it. So we just have to deal with whether we want to do that or not. Was that helpful, Dave? Yeah, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Clarifying questions on the tasks in terms of what is meant or clarifying questions in terms of the process? As a, as a note, everyone, this is Caroline speaking. I'm happy to kind of do some sort of office hours uh, with members this week. If you would also like, if, if you think of things along the way that you would like more clarification on um, or would like to talk about um, please let please know that that is something that is a possibility. And just a clarification or question on that, would that be okay under open meeting law or would that need to also be kind of broadcast to the public? So this I will is defer Stacey. to you on that. Yeah, if you're, if you're just reaching out to staff for clarification, like help me understand this, you're not talking about decisions or trying to influence or things like that, you're fine. It's just, you're, you're just getting some clarification. So there should not be any issues. And if there were several people on the call at one time, exercising discipline to make sure you're not um, pushing towards group decisions or influence of any kind, it's just fact finding you're fine, okay? And any other clarifying questions on your task at hand? Oh, go ahead, Dana. Yeah, um, yeah Carolyn and Chrissy, why don't you maybe uh, find some common times that both of you can be there uh, to have some sort of office hours to answer any questions and we can, uh, you know, summarize that for clarification, uh, I think. You know, this was, I think, a well-done presentation. It was, I thought, easy to follow, uh, but, um, you know, we have a wide range here on the on the committee and that. So I think having some office hours to allow committee members a little extra, any clarification or muddy points uh, would be good. Thank you for offering that. Thank you. Bye. Go ahead, Chrissy. Yeah, and just to note, um, our uh, Caroline's email, like, if it's just like a one question um, or the times don't end up working, um, you can just email the general email or Caroline's email if it's very specific to the research, but we'll get some common times for everyone. Okay. Our last lift for the day here is all about, um, and I'm summoning you over to the mural area that I want you to focus on, uh, is all about that charter, uh, which I find the most fascinating part of all of this work, but that's just me geeking out on the stuff that makes me happy, probably 
not many of you uh, are as passionate about developing fine work of art charters than I am, but there we go. It still needs to be done. And so while we're not going to complete the charter today, we do want to check in as much as time will allow us now on a couple clear areas that you can all reach a point of being able to live with. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means uh, so that we can keep working on getting that charter finalized. So there are a few bodies of work. I'm just going to start diving into them with you. Uh, and we'll get as far as we can get until the time runs out at 1230. So the first thing we want to do is look at those group working agreements and the principles for decision making. You'll remember we were dealing with them last month in the blue sections two and three. And we're going to use a tool called gradients of agreement to see where we're at with the work that staff has done taking in your raw information, your brain dump on these two subjects uh, and turning it into um, clearer language, we hope. So we're gonna go up to the blue zone. Everything up here is information from our first meeting. And I want you to first focus in and you're gonna be needing to, you know what? I'm gonna do this one because it's gonna be more uh, efficient with our time. We're gonna first look at the principles for guiding decision-making because it's all right here on the screen. You don't need to open up the draft charter that we e emailed to you. So this is how it works. And I'm going to just summon everybody again here. That way, Jess, you don't have to worry about finding me. There you go. So you'll recall at the last meeting, we started with some basic, what we thought might be good principles for all of you for group decision making. Remember, scientific rigor, collaboration and inclusivity, accountability and integrity. But you brainstormed up a few more areas here and here. And then you had a lot of comments. I've just turned everything blue about these and thumbs up and things like that. We took this feedback, we being staff, and rewrote these principles. That's what's in the green boxes. So your task, if you haven't already done this homework, is to read through these green boxes, how we've revised the, the principles for your group decision-making process. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. There you go, the seven green boxes. And ask yourself if you're comfortable with them. And I'm going to explain this gradients of agreement down below and then give you some quiet time to re read through those green boxes again. So the question that you're going to answer is, do you support these principles for guiding your decision making all together? Do you support all seven of those? And you can vote on this or give your input by dragging a star or making a star sticky if those stars don't appear and putting it up into e any of these categories up here. And you've got an alliteration to work with. You love it. You like it. You're, you're good with those. You know, I can live with those. So love it, like it, live with it or you're leery of it, all seven of those, or you loathe them. I won't be offended if you vote loathe. We use the alliteration because it's flat out easier and it's kind of fun. So do you love it? Do you like it? Can you live with it? Our goal is to get everybody up into at least loving, liking, and they're living with it because either all yes or all no is hard for almost everybody. If you are falling into the leery or loathing category, there's something really wrong here with those seven guiding principles. I ask that you put a sticky down here that explains why. So staff can take a look at your challenge and we can talk about it as a group and refine so that we can get everybody up to at least living with it. I'm gonna stop here and see if that makes sense so far.
Love, like, live with it is the goal. Leery of it, loathe it. There's some sort of problem that you have that we need to do some adjustments on. So with that, I'm going to shush up for a while and let all of you go back to those green boxes, read them through one last time, and then go down to that gradients of agreement and weigh in. If you voted, I'd like you to go ahead, go back to your meeting invitation with all of the materials and open up the charter draft that we sent to you ahead of time. So go ahead and get your charter draft open. If you would rather open the version up on the mural itself, and you know how to do that now, you can go over to the resources area and open up the current day draft charter. Not the old version from last month, but this version. So you got two ways to get to that charter. And if you need more time thinking about the gradients of agreement for the decision-making principles. Will you just raise your hand? I just need to know if we need more time here. Okay, I'm going to move on in about 15 seconds. And remember, members, this is going to be open until the end of this week. So you can come back in here and in the quiet of your own headspace, put your answers in too. So the next thing I want you to look at with the open charter in hand is section two over here. And we're going to do basically the same process, but this time because it was too much volume, I didn't put the final revisions in the mural. You can see them in the charter draft itself. But you'll recall at our last meeting, we started off with three key categories of group agreements, like how we're gonna play nicely together, general individual expectations, expectations for participating in meetings remotely, and expectations during challenging moments. So what is on the first level, the yellow, the dark green, the purple, was where we started with the draft that we provided to you. The blue level were your comments about what you changed or what you'd like on those. And then we had some additional comments down here. We took all of that information and if you open up the charter, you can see in our group agreements, our working agreements, how we've rewritten it. I want to give you some time to look at those if you haven't already in your prep for the meeting today. And we're going to do the same thing. As a batch, do you support these group process agreements? I love it. Star it. I like it. Star it. I can live with it. Star it. Or if you've got issues, that's fine. If you're leery of it or man, oh man, we really stunk it up, but loathe it, fine. Put a star there and give us a sticky note with why, what's going on that needs to be adjusted, okay? So I'm gonna be quiet for a while, but you always have the opportunity to come on mic and say, eh, whatever tech thing is not working for you, and we'll fix it, okay?
And if you've had enough of stars and stickies, just come on microphone and tell us how you'd vote. I'll do it for you. Hey, Stacy, it's Bennett. Um, just a quick mm -hmm. tech question. As I'm dragging yeah. a star from the um, gray area on the right into the grid, it disappears when I try to drop it in there. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to um, go to the, sometimes they're, they're not set up to go to the front. And so hang on everybody. I just wanna get this batch to the right of that current box. So where my cursor is moving around to the right of the current box, all of those should drag on top now. Does that make sense, Bennett? Do you see where I am? Yes, it does, thank you. Oh, good, sorry about that, everyone. And again, don't, ever hesitate any of you to say if you're running into tech issues. Chances are if you're running into it, somebody else is too. And until you've had a little bit more practice time in real time with Mural, it just, it just takes a little bit of time. But I'm pretty confident that the benefits will outweigh any technical challenges. All right, who needs a bit more time to look through information on group working agreements or process agreements, if you will, in order to vote? Just speak up or raise your hand. Just let me know. I don't want to move faster than you're ready to move. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do in our journey towards getting a charter all pulled together and, and, and looking good is to go up above where we had had some conversation about public comment and our communications and comments up here. And I'm gonna be turning it over to uh, MDH uh, to, to really comment a little bit more about what's what we ended up with in the green box. So just a heads up to Chrissy and to Dana perhaps. But where we started in these two blue boxes were communications the public should take into consideration that they're, whoopsie, let's just slide that big blue box out of the way, somebody. Um, uh, this should um, be consideration that this is a hot, button topic with negative historical memories, taking a measured approach and communicating that the task force is honoring the aim of the charter and the best interests of the public was one landing point, as well as there is a public email uh, or portal for public uh, to interact with or, or no, that, that's a question, I'm sorry. Uh, is there a public email or a portal for public to interact with or send thoughts to? It could be good to have access uh, to the best of those as task force members, or it would be good. That ended up in those considerations that you raised, this big green box down below, I'm gonna make it really big and give you all a chance to absorb it. I'll also read it for the people that are perhaps listening into this conversation. Uh, and, then, uh, and then I'll turn it over to staff to see if there are any other additions that you wanna make on this to help people understand uh, the thinking. So the, where we landed uh, is in the green box, the planning team will summarize and provide the task force with ongoing outreach from those sharing insights, feedbacks, or other information with the task force mailbox. Members can determine it appropriate to reach out to those willing to support work or provide expertise where relevant to ongoing work. Additional notes will be added to the site emphasizing the task force's charter and centering the interests of the public. The general mailbox will, be, will act as a way for the public to share feedback throughout this process and if opportunities arise for other community engagement, they will be noted on the site. 
Task force members are encouraged to share updates to their own networks and note the ability for the public to provide written perspectives, questions, or other considerations by the task force email. For example, if interested in supporting planning work or subgroup or subcommittee research efforts. So I'm gonna stop there and we're gonna just check in with uh, Chrissy or Dana to see if there's anything else you wanna highlight in this whole subject area of public communications and comments. Yeah, um, so that summarizes everything in a nutshell. I think, um, you know, we've emphasized it a couple of times, capacity um, and funding are limited. Um, with that being said, um, also, the task force can determine how some of the time in the future, um, whether that's, you know, having a specific allotment, maybe in one specific meeting, as opposed to some task forces have um, pre um, like set aside time. Um, one thing I will note is in Mural, um, we've added um, general email box um, outreach um, that you can see. And so that's on the bookshelf, the lowest bookshelf. I've put a little sticky note and that's just summarizing um, particularly um, there's a lot of folks who are interested in volunteering to support this work. We don't have um, the time to really think about those kinds of questions right now, but I want to say in that survey that y'all will get in the next week, um, that's going to include some um, feedback from you, like how might you want to consider? And so I just want to emphasize, thank you, Stacey, for going there. Um, mm -hmm. Reviewing those um, general um, inquiries, questions, um, comments, people's expertise, um, really, uh, I just wouldn't click on it because it does have um, some names and I just um, want to avoid um, sharing that publicly. Mm -hmm. But um, that will be your way of getting a taste of what people are coming and um, sharing their feedback on. Of course, that will change over time as people um, maybe listen in on some of these meetings. But anything that's going into the general email box will be shared with you in the future when we have that Google Drive. It will be an Excel uh, Google Sheet, um, whatever they call it. Um, and that will be like very much just like whatever the email says, it will be um, documented there. I just wanted for brevity's sake, um, left it to just um, overview with um, what people are saying they're coming from. So that's our biggest use of public engagement right now. Um, but anything that goes to that mailbox, um, if it's directed to the task force particularly or otherwise, you'll get um, what that looks like. Um, otherwise, the rest is to be determined by you with the understanding that um, you know, it's either in our task force time or capacity um, in work groups, whether that's, I know someone mentioned the consideration for potentially doing like select interviews with specific, um, particularly for instance, um, emergency personnel. Um, coincidentally, someone who works at, as an ER nurse reached out to the general email box and said they'd be happy to send like testimony and stuff like that. So that's for everyone to consider um, moving forward, how you might want to consider that. But right now we're responding, letting people know to um, re reach out with anything they want to share. It will be shared back to you. Um, and then if there's um, a more specific opportunity, it will be posted to the site and communicated to anyone who's inquiring about this work moving forward. Thank you, Chrissy. So members, if you've got any residual concerns about public communications and comments, pop them down in here underneath its section. That's just fine, okay? I'm realizing that we've just got a couple minutes left, so I'll save my other all things charter goodies for our next meeting in oh, January. Um, and, uh, and then what I'd like to do to end our meeting today and Jessica you may have other closing comments uh, I want you to come down here members and just as we did the last time I'd like to give you an opportunity to give us some meeting feedback we at MAD take this very seriously I hope you're seeing that we've made some adjustments based on your last round of thinking so if you go in here members and give us your thinking on uh, what worked what might not have worked um, down in the bottom is what I new ideas do you have that we should consider? And do you have any out, un, unanswered questions that you want to get in our ear? So that's where you can give us some comment on this meeting 
uh, and we'll, um, we'll act accordingly. So that's the last thing we have for you in terms of agenda items. The next meeting is January 8th. And with that, Jessica, and I'm gonna turn it back over to you for any closing comments or stray details that I might've forgotten. Yeah, thank you, Stacey. Um, I just wanna, again, express my gratitude and appreciation for everyone's knowledge and experience in, in the various areas that you represent. Um, and then just a quick reminder um, to highlight what Caroline was asking, if folks could try to have some feedback on, on some of the scientific research methods by the end of the week on Friday. Um, but thanks you everyone so much. And thanks to the viewers for watching. <laughs> if you're still watching this full three hours. Um, I look forward to connecting with everyone um, on January 8th in the new year. Very good, thank you. And I'm not going anywhere for a couple minutes. So if anybody has any logistical questions, stay on, happy to help, okay? Be well, everyone. Bye-bye. Nice job, everyone. And Jessica, have you turned off the uh, um, YouTube?